Hello and welcome back to the Level Up English podcast, the best place to come to practice the British accent, learn about English culture and, of course, the language and more with me, your host, Michael Lavers. I feel like that intro changes every time I do it and maybe that's part of the fun. We'll see how it progresses each time I say it in future episodes. But anyway, yes, welcome back. I hope you're doing well. If it is your first time, then a big welcome to you. Today is going to be a very casual episode because I'll be doing an AMA. If you've been a long time listener, you know what this is. AMA stands for Ask Me Anything. And this is the fifth one we have done, episode five of AMAs. I think these are really fun. And when I listen to another podcast, they're usually the first ones I listen to because it's a really nice way to get to know the host of the podcast and hear answers to lots of different questions. So we're not going to be looking at one topic today. We're going to be looking at several different topics. And maybe I can bring you behind the scenes for just a second and let you know why I'm doing this today because I'm actually recording this episode a little bit in advance. And this is just kind of what happens when you do a weekly podcast. You can anticipate, which means you can kind of predict and see what's coming up in the future. And I know over the next few weeks, I'm going to be very busy doing some traveling. And in fact, I can tell you, I'll be traveling a little bit around Europe. Uh, Hopefully that will work out anyway, which is very exciting, but I know that I'm not going to be in the best position to record a podcast. So while I'm still at home with my nice, good microphone, I thought I would record this one. And an AMA episode, it's pretty, pretty simple. I'm not going to lie. It's pretty simple for me to organize and make, but hopefully the outcome for you is still something interesting and enjoyable to listen to. So how this works is I usually reach out to my community and that is my uh, listeners or followers, I should say, on Instagram. So I always ask for questions on Instagram and also on the email list. So if you want to be there for future questions or just keep up to date with what I do and get some free lessons, you can follow me on Instagram. My Instagram handle, my name is English with Michael, no spaces. And if you want to join the email community, it's a little bit more uh, exclusive, let's say, with a smaller number of people there. There should be a link in your podcast description. Whatever app you're using, there should be a link that says, tap here to join the email community and get free lessons. And you can sign up there. Okay, I'm going to get right into this one and see how we do... I have a few questions. Some are very random and just fun. Some of them are English related. And yeah, I guess that, that those are the two categories, but uh, maybe some a bit more personal as well. Well, I, I think we've got a few we can get to, but I'll see if I can do all of them today. So Layla on Instagram asks me, Could you please guide me how I can improve my reading and listening at the same time? Fantastic question, Layla. Actually, Layla also goes on to say, I know that practice is the key, but I practice so much and I'm still struggling. So that's very relatable. Um, Obviously, it's good that you know that practice is key. With a lot of language learning, that's really what it comes down to. Just keep doing it again and again. But of course, if you're practicing something in an inefficient way, that means not the best way, your progress might be slower. So it is, of course, good to find the best way to do it. And I would say, first of all, find a way that you enjoy. If you enjoy it, I think you won't use that word struggle. For example, I like listening to podcasts and I... I would never call it a struggle when I listen to them because I enjoy it. I enjoy going for a walk and listening to my podcasts in Chinese or Japanese. And I don't really think about how much I'm improving because I just enjoy doing it, right? So find what that is for you. Find the way that you can enjoy uh, practicing. If 
you know, maybe you, you know already, I have made episodes in the past on listening and reading, but yeah, I haven't made one on those two together. So of course I'm going to recommend one thing, you might guess this, but one thing I would suggest is using something where you can listen and read together. My podcast transcripts would be a great resource for that because the live transcript for the members, they highlight the words as you're talking or as I'm talking or the guest. So you can listen along and you can read the words I'm saying. And I think this is so, so useful. I do this as well in my language learning because it's one thing to hear and one thing to read, but when you can connect them together, you realize, like, oh, this is how you spell that word. Or, oh, that's what that word means. I, I kind of heard it, but I didn't quite catch it. And, and there's little things like that that really click, which means make sense in your head when you hear and read together. And what I like to do personally, if I have time, is do a few step uh, process. So first of all, I will listen without reading. And if I have more time, I like to transcribe what I hear, which means I listen very carefully. I might have to repeat many, many times. And then I write down, or I type, what I think I hear. Then I listen again. And I this time use the transcript that is available. So I, I use a transcript and then I correct my uh, my transcription, my writing. So by doing this method, I have personally learned like, oh, okay, I'm not so good at listening to this sound. I'm not so good at listening to this. And it's really trained my listening, my hearing skills uh, on some specific sounds, which is really, really helpful. And yeah, of course, you can then listen again later uh, without the transcript again. And hopefully you're going to understand everything 100%. And of course, if there are any new words or phrases or grammar in the transcript, you can also note them down and practice too. So that's something I really enjoy doing, a little bit of combination and transcribing. I find that quite enjoyable. And it's also quite confidence boosting when I realize I got most of it correct. It's a really good feeling. So that, that's always cool. So that's one thing you could do. And I guess the other tip that I would just mention is you have to make sure that you're really actively studying because especially with listening, it's really easy to be quite passive and you're not really paying attention. I think that's why I like transcribing so much because it's, it's impossible to transcribe passively. You have to really carefully pay attention. So however you do that, just make sure you're really being active in your studies and you're actually focusing on what they're saying and you're really processing what you're reading or what you're listening to. But yeah, I'm always a big advocate, a big fan of combining skills. So if you can read and listen together and then maybe do some writing about what you were reading as well, and maybe some speaking, you could summarize what you just heard or read to your teacher or your friend or even just to yourself. When you combine skills together, uh, it's a really nice way to practice because reading and listening, these are forms of input, you know, it is going in your ears and in your eyes. But if you can also practice output, like writing or speaking, then that's going to help you remember so much more. So that's my final tip. See how you can combine those skills together. Hope that helps, Layla. I had another question, a very simple one from Alani, who asks, Two questions, actually. First of all, how many people are there in your group classes? So yes, I do group classes. I teach every Friday and we have other teachers, like at the moment we have teacher Emma, who's helping on other days, like Saturday and Tuesday. So we have a few group classes in the week and the number of students really varies each time. Uh, the highest we've ever had is about 25 and Last week, we had a very small class. We had like four or five people last Friday. So it can be quite small. It can be very big. But I don't think it matters too much because I always make sure to do breakout room activities. So that means every class we have at least 30 minutes or so where you are in a small group of people, two, three, four people, 
talking about what we're learning. And I might come in and check if you're okay, but I'm not going to interrupt you. So that allows you to have some conversation practice and ask any questions you need. So no matter how big the class is, I always make sure every single person has the opportunity to talk uh, for some time. So that's something I'm quite proud of in the class. And Alani's second question was, do you also offer private lessons? I heard about it in your first podcasts. Well, yes, you may have heard uh, when I started the podcast, my main work was private classes, one-to-one. But over the years, I've moved into different areas and I've got busier in different areas. And sadly, I had to stop the private classes. So sadly, I do not teach privately at the moment. This may change in the future, but one of the big reasons for me stopping the classes was that I just felt like I couldn't give my full energy to the students. You know, I I would be in a lesson and I would be thinking in the back of my head about the the podcast I had to record or some other work I had to do, preparing for a group class, and it wasn't fair on the students. So I decided to stop them until a hypothetical moment a possible moment in the future where I have more time. So we'll see if that comes and I will be very clear on the podcast and by email when I do open privately. But at the moment, I don't have any plans. So sorry about that. Uh, Aura asks, British unusual cultures, please, in most people's point of view. So I guess you're asking for some unusual cultural things in Britain, uh, or at least what most people would consider unusual. And I guess I'm not not exactly sure what I could say to this one because it's not so specific. And of course, to me, it's a bit more normal because I'm, I'm inside the culture. So I would be interested to hear what other people think is unusual in British culture. But I think a lot of the stuff you may already be familiar with. Uh, One aspect is this kind of extreme politeness that you might experience. And again, this is not everyone and some people might disagree, but I feel like compared to most other cultures, British people can seem to be very polite and indirect. You know, if you're indirect, that's also a sign of being polite. You know, rather than saying give me a coffee, you will say, oh, I wonder if it's possible to perhaps make me a coffee, maybe, please? And you make it very long and it's very indirect. Uh, and that's considered polite. You know, if, if I just said, uh, hey, open the window, that's quite, it's a little bit rude in English. But if I said, oh, I'm a little bit, a little bit warm in here. I'm quite warm. I wonder what I could do about that then I'm kind of asking you to open the window in a very indirect way. So that's a strange part of British culture. And perhaps this would be a good conversation for the future for a whole episode. But I think one thing that people often don't see is that when people in the UK are super polite, it can be sometimes a sign that they are annoyed with you or they're they're not so happy. And I think a lot of people don't see this. So there's a weird thing in the UK, and it's related to another word called banter, which uh, is a slang word. And it's kind of like the way that close friends talk to one another, especially men, I think, especially with guys. And it's kind of like insulting each other and talking to one another like you really hate each other. But you do that because you're good friends. Oh, you idiot. What are you doing? Are you stupid? But... Only good friends can do that, right? And maybe it's similar in your culture. You can let me know if you think it's similar. But generally, the more polite someone is, the more distance that is created between those people. So if someone's being very polite to you, it might feel quite nice, but also it's a sign that you're not super good friends. Maybe this is obvious. If someone calls you sir, it's very polite, but of course your best friend would never call you sir. And if someone calls you an idiot, maybe they really think you're an idiot or more likely they're just your friend and they're poking fun at you. 
So I don't know if that's unique to British culture, but I do find that very interesting. And I don't see that in other countries as much. Um, I have to be very careful not to insult my friends in other countries because in the UK it might be seen as a nice thing to do, but in other cultures it may be taken the wrong way and it may be quite insulting, so have to be very careful. Uh, of course another one is sarcasm. This is what I'm seeing more and more and more when I have, um, well now that I have many friends who are not from the UK, I'm quite sarcastic. I, I didn't know that before, but I reply to people in a very sarcastic way and my humour is very sarcastic. So I might say, oh, what are you stupid? Come on. How do, you, how do you not know this? And what I really mean when I say this is the opposite. You know, you're actually very smart, but because I'm saying the opposite thing, it's quite sarcastic and it's kind of a, a joke in that way. Uh, this would be obvious, I think, to people in the UK, but to other cultures, this extreme sarcasm is quite hard to understand. And especially when you have like a deadpan sense of humour, and that's when you kind of tell jokes with a serious face and you're not, you're not smiling, which I also think is common in the UK. But yeah, that's just what came to mind on that, on that one. I had another question, a random one from... It's so so, it's so so, something like that. I'm going to just read part of the names to keep you a little bit anonymous. But I'll call you so so. So, so so asks, What is your zodiac sign? And I will just say, I don't really believe in astrology and zodiac stuff. I'm a fairly skeptical person, which means I question things that don't have evidence. However, I always try to keep an open mind. And I think this is a really good skill for a teacher when you're dealing with different cultures. So I've had people in classes before tell me about their beliefs, their religion even, or stuff like that, like astrology. And I will never judge people for that belief, but I will question it in my head like, hmm, is this true? Let me listen and find out. I, you know, I try to be open-minded, even if it's something that I feel very skeptical about. And that is the case for astrology. To me, it doesn't really make any sense, but I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm open to hearing more about it if people want to share. However, I do know my zodiac sign is Aquarius, and this is for people born in January and February, uh, the end of January anyway, which is me. And I had to ask ChatGPT what that means. So Chat GPT says people who are Aquarius or this have the Aquarius zodiac can be quite independent and individualistic. I think that sounds right for me. I'm a very independent person. Also quite, what can we say here? Quite concerned with social issues. Hmm. I suppose I am. I don't know. It's hard to say. Th this is the problem, I think, with a lot of these things is I think almost anyone can say, yes, that applies to me. Because I am not, you know, always thinking about social issues. But of course I am concerned with social issues to some extent. But I, I kind of think everyone is. So I think most people could feel that these things apply to them. Another one is intellectual and curious. I would say I'm definitely very curious. I'm very curious. Friendly and sociable. Uh, I hope so. That's important to me to be friendly, so hopefully that's true. The next one is value personal freedom, which is one of my biggest values. So that's really true. I love having personal freedom. That kind of uh, influences everything I do. So it's definitely true. Um, what else here? N or Okay, m maybe I'm going to believe in astrology from now on because this is weirdly accurate. <laughs> The next one is non-conformist, which means you don't follow what other people do, and open-minded, which is what I was just talking about, right? So yeah, that's definitely me. I don't, I can be a little bit weird perhaps because I don't like to follow what everyone else does. And I do believe I'm quite open-minded. I think that's a good thing about myself. 
So there's a few, a few more things here, but yeah, generally it all sounds quite accurate. So who knows? Maybe there is some truth in this. I don't know. It's very interesting, but I do wonder how many people would agree with these points about themselves because they're quite general things that people like to think about themselves. You know, not many people will say, yes, I'm closed minded, right? That's just my opinion, but because I'm open minded, I'm going to I'm going to listen to your beliefs on uh, zodiac signs. <laughs> okay, let's do a few more now. Uh, maybe Ma uh, Madiha, Madiha asks, is there any language that is still on your bucket list and you really want to learn it? I like the idea of having a bucket list of languages that you want to learn. And... I haven't really thought about it. I don't think there is. I, I guess I do have a bucket list of um, alphabets I want to learn because an alphabet is something that you can learn in a few days or weeks, hopefully, and it can have a really lasting impact on your life. For example, I spent a, f a couple weeks learning the Russian, like Cyrillic alphabet, uh, maybe like five, ten years ago, and even today... I can still remember how to read uh, Russian uh, or any any language that uses the Cyrillic alphabet. And usually, you know, I can't understand what the words are, but there are some words that are the same. Or like, for example, I know that magazine, it means I like shop in, in Russian, right? So there are some words that I can recognize. And I think it's just quite fun. It's quite nice to know these things. You know, I know a few like... Thai, I can read the Thai language, of course, uh, Japanese and Chinese, uh, any more? I was learning the Georgian alphabet before, but I forgot that completely, it's very confusing. But the, the next on my bucket list to learn is Korean, the Korean alphabet, because I heard it's very easy and fast to learn, and I see Korean everywhere, especially here in Asia, so that would be a good one to learn for me. But when it comes to just a language, I don't really have any on my bucket list. I'm just happy. You know, I'm not going to, I don't really consider myself a polyglot who's going to learn many languages. I'm quite content focusing on Japanese and Chinese and I want to get them to a really good level, maybe in like 70 years. I don't know how long it will take. And I'm just going to pick up other languages as I need them. So right now I'm learning some Thai a little bit. And in the future, if I travel to another country, I'm going to pick up another language there, a little bit of that one. So it just depends on where I'm going to go in the future. But I don't really have much desire to learn many languages because if I learn too many, my current languages will suffer as a result. So yeah, I want to be very careful with that. Another question here from Dela, who asks, how can I improve my English speaking skills? Now, this is a question I have had so many times, and of course, it's understandable because it's one of the most important, biggest questions that uh, you might have, and it's something that we all need to improve on, right? I actually made a full episode about this. I know some of you may not have heard it because it was quite a long time ago now, uh, in 2021, and this was episode 102 of the podcast, and it was called how to improve your English speaking skills. And in that episode, I gave a few ideas on how you can practice on your own, just without a teacher, uh, for free, and also how you can practice with a teacher or in, even in a group setting as well. There are a few different options. But just really, I'm just gonna say the obvious here, a quick summary uh, in case you don't wanna listen to that episode. Uh, the key is just speaking as much as you can. Uh, it's always hard to get speaking practice, but anything you can do would be great. So speak alone, speak with a friend, uh, your dog, your cat, whatever it is, you can record yourself and make a podcast, even if you don't publish it. Something like that is really, really going to help. Uh, I always use the example of my own English. On episode one of the podcast, I had to edit so much to remove my um, ah, uh, th that kind of stuff. But these days, I don't edit much at all. And 
In fact, I don't think I've paused so far this episode. I don't think I've had any edits so far in 25 minutes today. So I've come a long way in my speaking ability in my native language. And it's really the same idea in any language. The more time you spend practicing, the more fluent you will become. And once again, I think it's a really nice idea if you can combine skills as well. So as I said before, read something from a book and summarize it to your teacher with your speaking, you know, with your voice. Or listen to this episode and uh, summarize what you heard or some key takeaways by recording yourself as kind of like a private podcast for yourself. There's a few things you could do like that and combining these skills together. Okay, I've got four more questions. I'm going to try my hardest to finish them all today. Uh, Marita asks, what do British people think of the American accent? Right, so they want to, this person wants to know my opinion on the American accent. And I think this will change depending on who you ask. I think different people will have different opinions. Uh, some people can say it can be quite annoying. I have heard that opinion. Uh, I certainly think it can be quite nasally in some uh, some accents. Of course, America is a big place, but nasally means kind of like that sound in your nose, almost like you're holding your nose as you're speaking, and it sounds a bit like in the nose, the voice. And, you know, that can be a bit annoying, but of course not all American accents are like that. Personally, I think American accents sound nice. I hear them a lot, of course, in movies and TV shows, so I'm used to hearing it. Uh, however, it really does stand out to me, especially when it's like one American in a group of British people. It, they're, it's just so obvious and, it, it, you know, it's a generalization, but I think Americans can be a bit louder than other English-speaking people, uh, countries. So it's quite obvious and it sounds very clear that they're from the USA. However, I do think it can sound really nice and really sweet. Uh, I love like the uh, Southern American like accent. It's very strong and it's so different from what I'm used to. And the, 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 the regional accents around the USA can be really fun to hear as well. They're, they're all quite nice. I'll just say the two aspects that really annoy me in some American accents, one is uh, upwards inflection. And upwards inflection is where at the end of every sentence, you go up at the end and it sounds quite annoying. Like every sentence is a question. And I think it's not just Americans. I've also heard this in like the South African accent as well. And I think this is universally quite annoying to many people. I know a lot of Americans will agree that can be an annoying feature of an accent. And the other one that really annoys me, you know, I'm very sensitive to sound, so it's no hate towards people who do this, it just, it bothers my ear, you know? And this is where people are, I don't know how I could describe it, that their voice is too deep and it's too much in, there's too much vibration in the throat. So forgive me if this annoys you, I'm gonna have a go at, at doing it, especially in American English where they go, so I was thinking that uh, so something like that. You know, I'm not very good at doing it uh, right now, <laughs> but it's a lot of vibration down here and it just kind of sounds like they need to cough to clear their throat. And it really annoys me. And usually when I hear people like that on a podcast, I have to just skip and delete that episode because it's not comfortable for me to hear. Of course, it does happen in other accents like British as well, but I think it's more common in American accents. So there we go. I said some good things about it and some bad things. Hopefully that was balanced, but uh, yeah, usually American accents can sound quite happy and friendly and welcoming and sweet. Uh, so let's just end on that happy note there. <laughs> okay, moving quickly on. Uh, Guilia, uh, hopefully that's how you pronounce your name asks, I can speak English, but the words I use are simple. Therefore, my biggest problem is how to learn or how to learn more vocabulary, maybe. Another big problem, a common problem, so don't worry. Uh, I'm sure we all can relate to this, that our words are too simple. I really feel this way with my Japanese as well. 
I can have conversations on different topics, quite a, a wide range of topics, but all of my grammar structures and my vocabulary, they're quite simple. I wouldn't worry too much about it though. I would just remind you that the main purpose of language is communication. So if you're communicating your ideas clearly, then it's not a big problem how basic and simple your vocab is. However, it is nice to improve it, right? And it, it can make you sound more interesting to listen to. Uh, you know, I don't have the biggest range of vocabulary when I'm talking. I, I, I don't use too many really advanced words. It's just not part of my habit, I guess, maybe because I'm not very smart. I don't know. But I guess that's another point, isn't it? That generally, you know, think about your own language. Native speakers don't use too many advanced words in their daily life. If you talk to someone on the streets of London, they're going to use words like nice, good, uh, amazing, uh, what else? You know, something like or that thing, that stuff, the stuff, the thing. I don't know. I can't think of any more words apart from stuff and thing, I suppose. But you get the idea that we use a lot of the same words again and again because, again, the idea is to convey a message in an understandable way. And sometimes big words can hinder, there's a, there's, a, there's a nice big word, can hinder, which means make it more difficult for the other person to understand, right? So that's something to consider. But obviously that's not exactly what you want to know. You want to know how to increase your vocabulary. So a huge way to do that is just lots and lots of reading. Uh, again, really active reading can be super useful and also just have faith in yourself that it is being absorbed. You might feel like you're not actually learning anything, but this has happened to me where I've been reading a book and then a few days later, I'm talking with a friend and that word comes to my memory and I'm able to use the word in a conversation. And I wasn't even aware that that word was in my memory. It was just hiding somewhere in my brain, waiting to be used. So I suppose, again, have a really good uh, high level of input and output. Input is how you're learning the words. So again, that's probably going to be reading or listening or both. So if you're listening to this podcast a lot, I try to use some hopefully new words each episode, maybe like hinder. And the more times you hear this stuff, the more it sinks in. But remember, the best way to practice is get more active in your learning and find a way you can output them. Uh, so you're taking them into your brain and then out of your brain through writing or speaking. You know, writing is an easy one because it's something that we can all do uh, without needing a partner to help us. So when you learn a new word from my podcast, for example, you can do some writing to practice, write a story about your own life or your plans for the weekend and practice using that word. And if you have a friend or teacher you can talk with, you can also try to use that word when you're talking. I don't do this anymore. I guess I've just got lazy. But one thing I used to do with English is I used to try to use new words with my friends. So whenever I learnt a new word uh, through like a podcast, you know, it's more of an advanced word, of course, I wanted to expand my own English vocabulary, I would save it on my dictionary app. And maybe this is a little bit weird, but I think it, it can be helpful. I would sometimes open my app while I was with my friends and, okay, challenge myself and say, I'm going to try to use this word somewhere in the conversation. And, you know, maybe within 10 minutes, you will find a suitable place to use it. And just the fact that you've used it naturally in a conversation helps the word sink deeper into your memory and makes it more memorable uh, because you've used it in a real situation. So yeah, just again, input and output, try to, try to work on that. Hopefully that helps. Okay, two more now, uh, not, actually these are quite nice ones to finish on, they're quite fun. So one here from Telmakam, Telmakamran. 
it's difficult to know if your name is included in there because it's just like one long word. But I'm going to call you Telma. Telma. So Telma asks, it's so hard to make friends with British people. What's the reason? Do you have any recommendations? That is an interesting one. Uh, I'm going to assume that you might be in the UK. If you're not in the UK, the advice might be different. I would say generally with British people, uh, they can seem very cold and closed. But for most people, again, generally, once you ask them a question or you initiate, which means start a conversation, they can open up quite quickly. I do find a lot of British people can be a bit awkward. Uh, I don't know if that's a cultural thing. I don't know why, but uh, I noticed that a lot, uh, especially with showing emotion, right? For example, Americans can be quite expressive and emotive when they feel happy. They really show their happiness with their words and their faces, their expressions, and it's really easy to tell how they're feeling. But I've noticed with British people, it can be a bit awkward to show strong emotions. Uh, you know, for example, when you're receiving a, a present, I see it's quite common to be like, oh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. That's that's very kind of you. And you can tell the person is actually very happy, but they're not really used to showing it. And I guess showing your emotions can be a sign of vulnerability. You're opening up to someone and that can be quite scary. So keep that in mind that some people may not be uh, always comfortable with opening up to strangers. But I, I would just say, first of all, don't be afraid of chatting to people. British people love to chat to people on the street, uh, in the queue for the supermarket. Not everyone's going to be that way, but generally a lot of people will be more than happy to have a chat. So don't feel uh, afraid to do something like that or just comment on the weather. That's always a good option in the UK. Oh, it's terrible weather today and see where that goes. You know, that could be fun. But if we take a step back, I can give my more general advice on making friends, which is trying to meet people that do or like the same things that you like. So this could be joining a club, going to a group where people are doing your hobby and making friends there. And it can be very hard if you're quite a shy person, but the more you open up, uh, the more you can make these connections and make friends so for example, here in Thailand, I like to do a few things. Like one of them is I go rock climbing, like indoor rock climbing. And I've met a few people there who I, I chat to when I, I see them. And that's a great way to meet like-minded people. That's people who like similar things to you. I also make sure to use or utilize technology and apps to make friends as well. Because if you're meeting people who also want to meet people, it's going to be much easier, right? So uh, a great uh, res resource is meetup.com, M-E-E-T-U-P.com. You can join a group and meet people there. If you're in London, for example, or any city, really, I'm sure there will be people to meet and make friends with, and they'll be very open to meeting new people. Another one I used to use a lot when I was traveling was couch surfing. This is an app which is it's primarily for staying at people's houses for free. Very interesting idea. But it also has a feature called Hangouts, where you can see people in your local area, usually these are travellers, who want to hang out. And this could be, you know, go get a drink, go explore the park, go get a coffee, something like that, or go to this tourist spot. And I made so many friends and connections with people through this app. Really recommend it. You do have to pay a small fee for this app now, but I would say it's worth it if you want to try just for one month. It could be a great way to make friends. So good luck on your mission to make some friends. Let me know how it goes. My final question is about my personal life, my plans from Miro, who asks, are you planning to leave Thailand forever? Or do you miss your home country? Short answer is I don't really have any plans. Uh, I think the current plan is maybe to stay here for a couple years. I really like Thailand and I don't miss my home country that much. I love the expression, the quote, home is where your heart is. And for me, that feels very true. 
I can get very easily comfortable in a new place, and now I consider Thailand my home. I feel much more comfortable being here than maybe even back in the UK. It's it's interesting how quickly you can get used to a new place and get you know, become part of that community as well. So there's a lot I like about Thailand, even just like I know a lot of my neighbours here, whereas in the UK it is quite unusual to, to know your neighbours if you live in like a block of flats, right? There's a lot of nice things about living here. Uh, I would say there are some aspects of the UK that I miss, but they're not strong enough to want to go back anytime soon. But the main things I miss... Well, one of the biggest things I miss, which you might not guess, is just the countryside, right? Thailand's nice, it's hot, it's got, you know, you can go swimming any time of the year, it's got really nice things like that, but it's a bit more restrictive and the countryside is a little bit less beautiful. It, it of course, depends where you go, but generally, if you go somewhere random in the UK, you've got fields and forest and anywhere you go, it will look fairly uh, picturesque, fairly pretty. However, in Thailand, if you're dropped randomly in the country, you may be in some beautiful mountainous forest area, or you may just be in these fields. And in my opinion, the kind of field areas here don't look so pretty. They're just very flat and uh, yeah, it's, it's not anything too special. So I miss that, but I also really miss the freedom I have in the UK. There's, there's so many uh, footpaths and hiking paths. You could just walk from town to town go hiking whenever you want to. And of course, the climate is very good for that as well. There are no mosquitoes or snakes or scorpions you have to worry about. Whereas here, it's a big worry. So uh, if you like hiking, I think Europe or, or USA, but Europe is such a good place to go or to be. So that's one thing I miss is just that freedom of walking around the countryside. Uh, but that's not strong enough reason to want to move back. So I'm going to visit from time to time, but I'm not going to plan to live there anytime soon. In fact, there are many more places I want to live before I go back to the UK. I'd love to live in Japan or China or other places maybe as well, but we'll see. I'm not a big planner for the future. I tend to take each day as it comes. So we'll see what happens and that's kind of part of the part of the excitement, isn't it? Okay. I am amazed that I got through all of the questions. So thank you all of you for submitting your questions. It was the perfect amount, slightly longer episode, but at least we finished. So thank you very much. And hopefully you enjoyed hearing my answers to them as well. Today, I have one review I'd like to thank. One more of you today, one final person. Uh, and it's a very nice one. So let me read this one now uh, from Apple Podcasts. And this says... Hello, Michael. I'm Jenny from Thailand. I have always been listening to your podcast for more than six months. And you always say, no one writes reviews here. Every topic you are talking about was not only interesting, but also useful. Thank you so much for creating an informative and enjoyable podcast for us. Have a nice day. That's so nice, Jenny. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, I, I, I think how the podcast reviews work is... I will not get any reviews for a few weeks and then I will mention that and I'll get like 20 reviews all in the same day. So it depends when you look at it, but uh, thank you so much for your reviews. I really appreciate all of them. And yeah, Jenny, that was a very kind review and it's nice to see you're from Thailand as well. Uh, so that's cool. I'm glad I have some listeners here too. So your review is boosting the podcast in the Thailand uh, Apple podcast charts and it's going to make me famous in Thailand very soon hopefully maybe <laughs> anyway thank you so much let's get to a quote now about questions very appropriate today so this one is from Voltaire who says judge a man by his questions rather than his answers hmm. so I'm judging all of you based on your questions <laughs> just kidding Thank you so much anyway for watching or listening today. Really hope you enjoyed this one. I'll catch up with you soon in the next one. Goodbye. You have been listening to the Level Up English podcast. 
If you would like to leave a question to be answered on a future episode, then please go to levelupenglish.school forward slash podcast. That's levelupenglish.school slash podcast. And I'll answer your question on a future episode. Thanks for listening.